And before I jump into calling them, I can see um, Pauline Arunga. Mm -hmm. Pauline Arunga is a, is a familiar name. Pauline, mm -hmm. if you can hear me, say hi. Mm. Um, hi, good evening. Good uh, my evening. name is Pauline. I was in Lapid cohort five and uh, I'm happy to join you this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, always a pleasure uh, to have you in our sessions and I'm glad to uh, be known as a Lapida. And I have Emmanuel um, Jose in the chat box saying he's calling in from Nairobi. Karibu sana, Emmanuel. We hope that you will find this session to be as insightful as we have prepared it to be. I also have a few mm -hmm. interesting faces on my screen. I have Panji Ponjoroge. Mm -hmm. uh, like and we have, have a hand up. We have a hand up actually from Joseph Washira as well. Um, Joseph. Hi. Hello. I hope you are well. My name is Joseph Washira. I'm joining in from Kapsabet, nearby to Eldoret. I think Dennis Karako you have met. Mm. Ah. <laughs> me we me. me. <laughs> ah, 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 good stuff, good stuff. Uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't have said you're from Kapsabet, uh, mm. but I believe it's it's a conversion for another time. I'm glad to have you, Joseph. Uh, uh, yes. Outside the tent. All right, all right. I can see I we have saw. someone from the chat box with the name of Nasra. I care to introduce her. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So I see in the chat that we have Nasra Nasir. Uh, Nasra, um, she says that I'm Nasra Nasaid from Malindi. Wow. We are so happy to have you from Malindi. Please pass all the warmth of Malindi and the ocean. And we actually want to see more chats. If you're here, we would really, really, really love to hear where you are ge geographically doing this call from because we know that we have a very, very interesting conversation prepared uh, for you as we go ahead. So let's see more people texting us in the chat. But maybe Karafa, in the meantime, as we get more chats, I'd like to hear from you. So today's topic will be about finding purpose and meaning from your work. Would you say that you have found yourself in a position where you could consider the work that you're doing as giving you purpose and meaning? Well, yes, yes and no. Uh, but also it will be a good interpretation of what purpose and meaning looks like. Um, every day that I get to work and earn my keep is a, is, a, is a day that I will consider I have found purpose in my work. Uh, even mm -hmm. when I didn't enjoy that particular day, I mean, coming home to be able to afford a meal is, is just enough to say, you know, maybe the purpose of today's work was for mm -hmm. me to be able to afford food. Uh, mm -hmm. But then there's also the kind of, I've, I've been in spaces where, especially work that hasn't, been, uh, I couldn't correlate it with earning money. Say, for example, volunteering uh, mm. or supporting someone doing something. I find mm. that kind of work to be very fulfilling in and in itself. You know, uh, mm. trying to make a difference. I also try to figure out um, where do I fit in this jigsaw of a puzzle that's called the universe. And uh, with mm. it, you know, work work is something that was made for man. Or mm -hmm. I don't know, man was made for work. Um, I'm trying to quote the good book uh, over here, and, and so even trying to every day I, I I work to intentionally remove the connotation of work is suffering or, or work is something that I do and I don't like it. Uh, mm -hmm. To say life is about work, and mm -hmm. how the, then the question is how do I orient my work to mm -hmm. things that I find more meaningful to myself. Now I've said a lot of things. I don't know whether I was answering your question or I was answering my own question, but I hope you'll be able to catch something there. But also, I just like to throw it back to you. What's mm. your relationship with work? Do you like it? Uh, mm, uh, first, I like that you've thrown it back to me. Uh, I can say that I've been privileged to find that many times I'm doing, I've done work that also felt like it was relating to me um maybe connected to my purpose but i also have 
to be very honest because you know this is not about a Hollywood movie or anything like that we are doing. I've also found myself in very many instances where I am doubting, is this purpose? Is this not purpose? To the extent that one of the conclusions I made is that perhaps we overthink what the problem is, uh, that maybe it's not that serious, or we think purpose is something outside of ourselves, so we keep looking for it, and maybe it's already something that we have within. But I would say that I've experienced both ends of the spectrum, feeling very connected to my work, and also instances where I have felt like, oh, I don't know whether this connects with my, my purpose at all, I'm not even sure what I am doing in that particular space anymore. But at all given times, at least, I like the lessons that I have learned from that. And maybe before before I bring it back to you, uh, perhaps we could hear from more of us who are present in this call. First and foremost, we are so happy for the new people that are continually joining us. I would like to hear from you. If you are in this call, we want to see where you currently located, uh, your physical location, as you do this call, please let us know. We will be having a very interesting conversation on the topic of finding purpose and meaning from your work as a tool to reinvent your career. Then secondly, something else that I would like to share is if you are in this call and you know you have a friend who needs to be part of this conversation, share the meeting link with them and let them know that we have started the meeting tonight. Tell them, tell them, tell them, tell them we have started and our guests will be coming in in a few. But for now, I'll be inviting my colleague, um, Tarafa. I remember you saying that anyone that calls you Dennis is your enemy. So. <laughs> I'll try, I'll try to speak uh, to Tarafa so you can play uh, just a short video for us that we have to can as we welcome more of our guests tonight and then we are kicking off our conversation tonight. But if you're here once again, please let us know where are you doing this call from, your physical location. Let us know in the chat, text us so that we are able to recognize you as well as, as well as, as, well as, as let us know let us as well. Know. Maybe some of your expectations for the okay. conversation. Um, Karafa, over to you. Even as we wait to hear from more of the of uh to hear from more of the people that are present with us in this call tonight. Thank you, Rispa. And maybe just to set context to the video that I'm about to show you is that uh some of you might not be aware of us as Lapid Leaders Africa, the kind of work that we do. What uh, we live for as an organization, and this is just a brief video to give you an, an overview of who we are, uh, what we've been able to achieve so far, and also give you an opportunity to learn about the kind of programs that we run over and above this masterclass. And be, after the video, then we'll just come back to introduce the session fully and guide you on what to expect today. Uh, we've just had a brief conversation with Rispa about our understanding of work, and we'll be diving much more into that because we believe that work is something that needs to be purposeful. Uh, we live in a in a in a in a world where we are expected to contribute, not only contribute but contribute uh, wholesomely to everything that we engage in, and that is one of the reasons why we as an organization exist. And we'll be telling you more about who we are in this particular video. And I'll be sharing my screen. If you can see it, just let me know, Rispa, and um, I can proceed. Okay. Hey. I'll let you know. Awesome. Uh, yes, I can see your screen. My name is Esther Mwaniki. I am the founder and CEO of Lapid Leaders Africa. I founded Lapid Leaders Africa with the primary goal being to ignite prowess among the next generation of African leaders. Our goal was and still is to develop the next generation into change makers. People will make a difference within the continent. We run three fantastic programs within Lapid Leaders Africa. The first one is Crossroads program. The second one is a digital apprenticeship program. And the last one is our flagship program. Crossroads program seeks to equip young professionals with management skills and leadership skills to enable them to be able to drive change within the organizations that they are in. We work with young professionals who have about five years of experience up until 10 years of experience. 
the digital apprenticeship program seeks to, to uh, place our students within small and growing businesses. And the young leaders would then serve these businesses in terms of providing them with digital marketing and data analytics, and ultimately enable them to be able to build into the business's operation efficiencies and expand the markets that they serve. The last program, and it's one of my favorite programs, is flagship program that serves uh, university students and recent graduates and equip them with the skills, the mindset, the experiences and networks that they need to be able to successfully transition to the marketplace and ultimately to be able to drive change in those marketplaces. The flagship program is broken down into three distinct uh, pillars. The first one is Lead South, Lead Marketplace and ultimately Lead Africa. Lead South is one of my favorite pillars and it focuses on building the self-awareness of our young leaders. We also focus heavily on building their mindsets and so we are constantly asking what does it look like for you to understand the opportunities in Africa and ultimately to become a change maker within the continent. We uh, attach the young leaders to coaches and mentors, work with them and work with them to enable them to understand themselves and ultimately to be able to be purposeful in their careers. The lead marketplace pillar focuses on job readiness and workplace preparedness. And because of that, we have a lot of conversations around personal branding, around what, and we enable them to get career coaching that helps them to be able to understand themselves from a career perspective. Lastly, we have the Lead Africa pillar, and the Lead Africa pillar focuses on helping the young leader understand themselves as a Pan-African. And because of that, we equip them with entrepreneurial skills, we attach them to various businesses and expose them to various businesses where they're able to see the practical side of being a change maker and building a business. I, at the end of the Lead Africa pillar, we provide our young leaders with an opportunity to be able to travel uh, to a country within the region. In the past, we've done Rwanda, we've sent some students to Ethiopia, to Zambia. And the goal of each of these trips is to enable them to build up an African mindset. By the end of 2021, we will have developed over 1,000 young leaders. And we anticipate in the next five years, we will develop 15,000 young men and women who will drive change within the continent of Africa. We'd like to invite all young leaders across the continent to apply for the program. If you're an ambitious young leader who looks to build a purposeful career and who's looking to be part of a community of people who will make a difference within the continent of Africa, you need to apply for this program. If you're a parent to a young leader and you're looking to ensure that they are on the right momentum, if you would like your young leaders to be part of a community of people who will challenge your young man or woman to be the best version of themselves, you have to support them to join this program. Enable them financially, emotionally, and support them throughout the program. And lastly, we would love to build a village of partners that we will work with to accelerate the work that we are doing with this, within this continent. Our goal is to reimagine the possible and we invite you to partner with us in this. Partner with us as an employer, partner with us through funding the programs, but ultimately partner with us to imagine the possible within the continent of Africa. to a top fashion college in France. What's this? Not now, mom. I don't care, Summer. Hello, hello, hello. And that's just a short video explaining some of the work that we do at Lapid Leaders Africa. Allow me to mute everyone just so that we have um, a level of order in terms of what we are hearing from each other. Marapa, thank you so much for sharing that video with us. And I think that gives us a bit of information about um, what Lapid Leaders Africa does. And now I'll be handing it over to you because I think our conversation is ready and set to get started around how we find purpose and meaning in our work. I'm so delighted to have been part of this just for this short period of time. And I'm honestly trusting that we are going to have such a wonderful conversation this evening. And yeah, I look forward to seeing the reviews and the conversation here. Over to you, Karafa, and enjoy this session. Thank you very much, Rispa, for that particular introduction. I would like to invite um, everyone to just maintain their microphones off unless they have been invited to speak for the sake of good order. Uh, to those who are recently just joining us, my name is Dennis Karapa. I serve as the Chief of Staff at Lapid Leaders Africa, and I will also be doubling as your host uh, for this evening session. And today, marks the beginning of another series of webinars that we will be running as an organization 
Uh, first part of the year, we did run the Rebirth series and we had quite a number of guests coming in, notably, uh, I think we hosted Kaleche, Farid Kimani, our very own CEO, Madam Minister Moniki, among other guests. And we have evaluated various things around uh, how we could rebuild our brand, how we could reimagine ourselves afresh. Uh, and we're coming in from uh, even how we could grow our networks. And now today we will be opening up um, this conversation to a new series that we call the Renaissance uh, Masterclass series. And we will be piloting it for the next three, four weeks. And we will be covering various topics. And today's topic is around how do we find meaning and purpose in the work that we do. And so one of the key things that we believe uh, as an organization and also for myself as an individual is work is meant to have meaning. And it's not necessarily meaning from a point of, I feel like I enjoy my work, but also from a point of, I, I believe that I am contributing to the well-being of society through my work. And we will be looking at some of those conversations as we go through uh, today's uh, webinar. But first, even before we just jump right into it, I would like for us to do a quick poll. And the poll is going to be around uh, work and how we as Kenyans actually relate to work. I have just launched a poll and on your screen, uh, you have two questions. I would like for us to just take a minute or so just to be able to um, respond to it. First question that we're asking you is, will you say that you feel your work connects with your purpose? Um, and the next one is, what percentage of Kenyans? Do you think the report has feeling you can do? You see that we have a few. Right. Yeah. Interesting, interesting um, input coming in. All right, aha. Uh -huh. All right, I can see that we have a good number of us who feel that their work does indeed connect with their purpose, and that is very commendable. Uh, I can also see that a good number of us believe actually that most Kenyans are rest are reporting to feel disengaged from their work. And so I find that to be a bit of a conundrum, you know, given that I believe most of us in this call are calling in from Kenya and we will be part of whether the work that we do actually connects with the purpose. And so I'd like for us just to discuss this a bit more uh, before we welcome the speaker for today. Uh, I don't know who's feeling courageous and they would like to just call in and, and share their the reasons behind uh, what they voted in. For example, on my screen, I have James. James, if um, you're willing, I would like to invite you just to share a bit more about uh, why you chose what you chose and question number two around Kenyans feeling disconnected from their work. Right. Um, I don't know, James, if you're here or if not, I'll just welcome anyone who's available and who would like to contribute to the conversation. Why do you think um, most Kenyans, if you are one of the people who voted as most Kenyans are disengaged from their work, actually experience that particular phenomenon? Um, hi, hello. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, should I go or is someone else speaking? <laughs> no, it's okay, Eli. Uh, slow oh. is yours. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Eli. Uh, so your question was, why do you think most Kenyans report that they're feeling disengaged from their work? 
uh, okay, I think this is from, let's say, experience I've seen with friends. Most people okay. you get, uh, they're doing something because their parents told them to go and do it. For example, in my case, uh, my parents wanted me to do education. And I was like, no, I'm not doing this. And uh, my brother, on the other hand, he did education, but it's not something he wanted to do. So he found he, he has found himself in a place where he's like, I don't feel passionate to do this, but now what do I do? I have to do this just to put food on my table. So, yeah. All right, all right. That's a very interesting bit. And so you've introduced a factor of sometimes do you do work because it needs to be done, because there's a living to be made, and or do I necessarily need to follow my passion, purpose kind of conversation. And I think this is some of the things that our speaker for today will be unpacking as we look through our conversation today. Thank you very much, uh, Ellie, for, for sharing that. And for the rest of us, feel free to use the chat box. Should you like to engage, should you like to ask a question, we will be looking out. Uh, for your comments and any questions that you might have, and we'll find a way of responding to that during uh, today's conversation. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest speaker for today, uh, who's our very own founder and CEO of Lapid Leaders Africa, Madam Esther Moniki. She has served uh, as the visionary, vision bearer of Lapid since 2014. And before that, she has a background uh, with working in, in the finance giants PwC, Guarantee Trust Bank as the head of risk and finance, uh, sorry, risk and compliance. And since she started Lapid Leaders Africa, she has trained, she has overseen the training of over 1,500 young leaders and over 20,000 young people and professionals have applied to the Lapid program. One of the biggest passions that Esther has is around mentorship and particularly working with young people and professionals to help them find meaning in their lives by being able to unlock their potential and find purpose in their day-to-day -day lives. And so without taking too much time, I would like for you, ladies and gentlemen, to join me in welcoming Esther. You can use the clap emojis on your screen so that we can kick this off uh, with a loud bang. Now we only have two people clapping and that is not enough. Uh, if this was an in-person setting, we'll have done Makufi Anyayo, Russia, Russia. And you guys know how all these things go before the guest speaker comes in a bit of food stamping uh, just to make sure that we are primed and ready for the conversation. I hope you're in a place where you are not distracted, where you will be able to uh, take notes and also ask questions where you need to. Esther Moniki, if you're here with us, you can just do a sound check to confirm that you are set uh, before I hand over the session to you. Santini Sana, I believe your clubs have been more than welcoming. And I believe that we have set the right tone for today's conversation. Hi, Karafa. How are you? I'm okay, how are you? I am very well. Uh, the crowd has said Karibu Sana. They are really looking forward to getting your insights on today's conversation around purpose and connecting our work to it. Very good. OK, thank you. Um, it's nice to see all of us here. I see a lot of familiar faces in the call. I think we have several people from the current cohorts who joined in. Um, so it's nice to see you all. I wanted to start with just a quick run through of a few slides. I ordinarily don't do slides in the um, the webinars, but for this one, I wanted to start with some slides because they will set the pace for a conversation that will continue. Um, so today is more of an introduction than it is the, the main session. We will have a series of masterclasses around the Renaissance. Um, we intend to have the next series or the next session on Monday. Um, on Monday, we'll be talking about tech for good. I will actually be doing it from um, India, though we will be having a summit in India where we'll be talking about how an organization there is leveraging on um, 
on tech to do good. And so the whole conversation around social protection, give me two minutes um, and then I log in with some different gadget. Give me a minute, Akrafa. Right, and and maybe just even as we look at um, the screen that we have today, um, the conversation is based on a masterclass series around renaissance. Are we familiar with what the term renaissance means? Uh, is this something that we've heard of outside our history books? Is this something that we have induced uh, as Africans within our own context? Uh, if you like to share a bit of this, I would also like to hear from you guys. What's your understanding of the remains? What does it mean? You can see we have a few individuals who have unmuted themselves. I believe they're priming for the conversation. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and call them. Uh, Agui Polika, if you're here with us, what is your understanding of the remains? Right. Now, I'm going to share with you a dictionary meaning of the term renaissance, and we can uh, build it up from there. Uh, maybe I start. I, I don't know whether I'm, I'm already diving into your slides, uh, but um, the all-knowing Google says a renaissance means a rebirth or a revival. And it has been um, discussed in light of art, history, architecture, and I'm curious to see what context are we going to be looking at Renaissance in this webinar series? Okay. Thank you. I, please, uh, I like that definition, so please read it again. A rebirth or a revival. Okay. Oh, you left for me to go with the art, the history, and all that? It's fine. I will connect with all that. I like that uh, definition because actually it's part of what I want to talk about. Um, So I think, let me just start afresh. My name is Esther Moniki. I'm the founder and the CEO of Lapid Leaders Africa. I'm happy to be here and doing this session. I'm sure you've been given a bit of context. We've been doing a webinar series every month. Um. This month is a little bit special. We will make it a masterclass series, and it's themed around the Renaissance. And our goal is to expand on what I will introduce today, but focus on it, on specific aspects of it. We run a program that we call Crossroads that targets people who've been working for more than five years and feel that they are at a crossroads with their career. Um, oh, generally with life, they feel that they are at a crossroads. Um, and one of the things that we focus on is a conversation around what we call earth is hiring. And it talks about a lot of the changes that are going on in today's world, what we need to prepare for the, uh, for those changes. And so this series will actually fit into that program um, and it will focus on a conversation around what does the Renaissance mean, which is an aging time that I will introduce briefly today. And um, what are the lessons that we can pick up from that Renaissance? Um, as I mentioned, I, the first masterclass will be around tech for good. I'll actually be hosting. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to host it. Um, that session, either myself or Karafa will be able to host it. I, and it will bring together two very different technologists. One is a strategist that I've worked with in the past that I respect greatly and that, that has agreed to come and talk about some of the advances within the technological spaces and how we can convert them to be tech for good. And then we have another lady who is heavily involved in a lot of work within the technological space and has been worked in Google, in Facebook and other companies. And it will also be bringing the conversation home around tech for good. I will be in India and we'll be talking about um, an organization. I'll be part of a conference uh, with one of the Obama fellows. Um, and it's a conference where we're talking about an organization that's using technology to make access to social protections um, easily accessible and so they're having conversations around digital goods digital infrastructure and how all those things can be brought together towards serving for good so monday next week you um, especially in that space of crossroads unfortunately this won't be an open session because it will be specific to conversations around crossroads um, we start a master class series we start with technology and then we move towards climate and other things that are happening in the space of renaissance but today we do an intro around what Renaissance is. 
and why we are sitting with the word renaissance. Um, renaissance, again, this is going to be a really quick run through. If you have been in my space, I can do very many conversations. Um, but I just tried to collapse this just for purposes of introduction. The renaissance is a period in time. I mean, it means the rebirth and actually in French, the French translation of rebirth is renaissance. Um, and it is a period in time within the European space that was significant. Um, in many ways, it was the intersection between the Middle Ages and modernity. Um, the Middle Ages why in many ways termed as the Dark Age. Um, there was a lot of war. There was a lot of ignorance, depending also with how you define ignorance. There was a lot of famine pandemics. Um, one of the bigger pandemics is called Black Death that saw the death of very many people. So that was sort of the Middle Age. And it was in many ways termed as a Dark Age because of all the issues that it had. The Renaissance gave birth to what we call modernity today. And so a big part of the reason why I was intrigued by Carafa's de definition on art culture is because that's what was used to transition to modernity. So they used art, culture, and many other aspects to be able to do that transition from the dark age to the modernity. So that's sort of the big picture of the Renaissance. The reason I like this terminology of the Renaissance is I'm convinced that we're in the middle of another Renaissance. And if you're in the space of tech and a lot of the space of the climate change, you can see how that Renaissance is happening. Um, in between the quick advancements in technology from AI to Web3 to ML and everything else that's happening in technology, to also the significant issues that we're facing from a climate perspective, we are in many ways in between a renaissance um, that is likely to be faster than the older ones because of the world that we live in today. And so the question that I wanted to sit with and will continue to sit with is what are some lessons that we can learn from the renaissance that could help us in between this transition? And so what I'm spending some time on is a bit of intro on the renaissance. Um, I talked about at the heart of the renaissance was art. And so a lot of the famous artistic works that you see today were bathed during the Renaissance. So the Mona Lisa photo, I thought of putting them all here, I didn't, but I'm sure some of you have seen the Da Vinci, Da Vinci, Da Vinci code, code um, kind of photo by Mona Lisa. And the Last Supper, there's a photo that's done of Christ and the disciples based on their imagination. It was created during the Renaissance. Um, the statue of David, the bath of Venus. There's also a photo for the creation of Adam. I think I had that. Um, these are the images that you're probably likely to know. Each of these images were put up during the Renaissance. And so on the my left is one of Christ walking through the markets. And one on the right is of the separation between good and evil that came about because of sin. And that was depicted through photos. And so each of these things um, were created during the Renaissance and they were used to propel conversations forward, which was the power of, which is still is the power of art and culture. But if you want to shift a way of thinking, the best bet, one of the best bets is around art and culture. And imagining that you were in a dark age where people hadn't seen such images and such, sort of the impact of this on people's psychics and people's um, sort of um, perception of life. And so that's why it was a significant time. And then around then the printing press was discovered, which literally changed the world because then now you could spread ideas. So while before I had an image of say, for example, the last supper, you could print the last supper because of the printing press and that could be spread across the world. And so during this renaissance, that's when the printing press was discovered or innovated. It's almost like the way today you have a laptop or you have chat GPT or you have a Google. So this was a significant change at that time that printing press came about. And because of that, then you could spread ideas with ease. And, and that was both technological changes and action. The Tarafa perhaps one of the things you could help me with is muting everybody. Um, yes, and 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 you cannot talk about Renaissance and not talking about religion, um, and also 
I am very faith driven. And so I'm also able to connect those two. Um, and one of the bigger things that changed during the Renaissance is religion. Um, so I talked about art, but also religion. There was a higher focus on what was termed and is today termed as humanism. Um, and it's also what gave birth to what you call humanity in terms of education. So if you've done arts, um, if you've done education, you will have had a lot of conversations around humanities. And a lot of those conversations came about during the Renaissance. And the focus was so before this renaissance, there was a huge focus on the Roman Catholic Church, and they're the ones who drove a lot of the conversations, and this was especially in Italy. Actually, the renaissance started in Italy, and that's why it's a, a European kind of um, era, age kind of thing. And so in Italy, the Roman Catholic was big, everything was driven by the Roman Catholic Church. Um, but one of the things that was also happening, everything was, there was less agency. And so those conversations around don't act on your own capabilities, depend on the will of God. And what the Renaissance did is it started to question that idea. Um, can we act on our own capabilities? What if humanness is the biggest thing that has happened? And so the empowering of humanity started to happen during that Renaissance. Um, and one, a shift from just the dependence on the will of God and two, an elevation of the human mind. Um, and so, and then also people learned to read, to write, to interpret ideas. They could have their own voice heard. And then because of the read, the write and interpreting of ideas, people started to critique um, the religion, to have a close examination of their principles. And that's what led to someone you probably have heard of called Martin Luther, who was a German monk. Um, um, and he led the Protestant Reformation. And it was a conversation around him questioning the Catholic uh, principles. And that came about during the Renaissance. Um, he questioned many of the practices of the church, whether they aligned with the teachings of the Bible. And that led to the Renaissance. The reason I like this conversation and something that we will expand a bit more as we do the master classes, it asks the question of religion and innovation and human. That intersection has always been a place that people need to question and debate about. Um, and this shift of rena renaissance was anchored primarily on religion and its impact on human. Um, and I do think that every era will always have that conversation. And so we will start to ask where, and one of the slides talks about this, but where is Africa as far as religion goes? Um, and what kind of impact would the Renaissance have on Africa today are conversations that need to happen as we go through um, whatever it is that we're talking about. Some of the impacts of the Renaissance, um, the population became, started becoming wealthier. Um, there's, a, there's a podcast that we normally watch as part of the flagship that was done by um, Mothoni Wadrama and Eric Thimba, and I'd encourage you guys to go and look for it. Um, but that talks about the history of um, the aristocrats and sort of how we landed in here. This Renaissance gives you a bit of history in the context of that um, aristocrat conversation. And so because of the Renaissance, because of the access to knowledge, because of the access to ideas, the population became wealthier, um, which led to an increase in trade and travel and the spread of new ideas. So remember, you're talking about from a middle age, a dark age, where people were just cocooned. But because of a Renaissance, Renaissance life changed. Um, the rise in prosperity also generated an interest in education. People started to see a connection between education and the wealth, supporting the flourishing of the arts, promoted scientific discoveries. But on the other end, it also led to an increase in individualism, in secularism, and ultimately that led to the economic system that drives today, which is around capitalism. And there are conversations that people need to have around is it all good at their conversations that need to be have had around. There's a book I encourage people to read called Conscious Capitalism. I do personally believe that capitalism in itself does not serve Africa in any way. Um, and so we need to be able to ask. So people are moving towards conversations of conscious capitalism, but we need to have a debate as to whether even capitalism in the way it's structured is able to serve um, the African society. And so the Renaissance stressed upon the values of freedom and dignity, and that resulted in what's 
uh, prevalent, which is around individual freedoms. And, and then ultimately, that led to a shift, the same way you saw a shift in religion, you also, uh, it also led to a shift in the balance of power and the Europe's ruling cl uh, class. Now, the reason I did that, and this you can, there's a paper that has been done by Harvard that goes into a, more a lot more detail on this. Um, I'll try and compile some of those things in the email that will be sent out to everybody who's registered. But the, the reason I did that is I do believe there's some lessons we can pick up from that, good and bad lessons. I wanted to focus here on the simplistic, simple um, lessons. And then perhaps as we go along, we will dig into some of the things that we need to question as far as the Renaissance goes. Some of the simple um, lessons that we need to pick from the Renaissance is one, talent needs patronage. Um, if you look at the people who financed because it was financed, um, there's a family that was called the Medicis that financed the Renaissance. And what happened at the start is there's a, um, one of the members of the Medicis was in the streets. So this young boy who, by then wasn't known, but he later to be, came to be known as Michelangelo. Um, and he was trying to put up a sculpture that was the intersection between humans and being a goat. You will have seen this if you've traveled. And the Medici's family was intrigued by this 14 year old boy who was determined and focused to be able to put together a sculpture that brought together those two things. And so what they did is they took this 14 year old boy and took him into their family. And he started to be educated alongside the kids of Medici's. And in many ways, um, history shows that was the best investment they ever made. Um, and there's a lesson there around innovation that's important for Kenyans, for Africans, um, that we can pick up from the Renaissance, that talent needs patronage. Um, and a simple way to say is talent needs sponsors. Uh, if you think about the Renaissance being bathed and propagated by the Michelangelo's and the art that they created, they were able to do that because there was a sponsor as a patron called Medicis who saw potential and was able to invest in them. And that same principle needs to apply in any city and in any organization. There must always be people who can identify talent, invest in fresh talent, because this was a 14 year old young man, um, and invest heavily in that talent. And over time, people are able to reap from that. I think that's something that we need. And if you think about it from an African perspective, it in effect talks about the value of apprenticeships and um, that were very prevalent in our society. Um, and so talent needs patronage has and will always be a thing that builds significant shifts. And so when you think about that in terms of where we are at now, the question we need to ask is who are the patronages within the tech space and um, within the reimagining of the climate space? Who are the Africans who are seeing talent and investing in them? Um, and that's the reason, for example, as Lapid, we exist. But we are very aware of the fact that this needs to be done at a wider scale that is going on at the moment. The second thing that you see during the Renaissance is the power of mentorship. Um, Leonardo, Leonardo um, da Vinci, uh, this is something that's important. He sat under some a previous painter who is not known for of very well, um, but for 10 years, Leonardo was just sitting under that guy. I can't remember the name very well. I think it's Helena or I can't remember the actual name. And for 10 good years, he sat under that uh, mentor and he started out as a basic person, like many other person cleaning the houses, digging, like doing basic work. And the reason I like that as a lesson is we live in a time where all young people are running towards the big office. Um, we are a more ambitious generation. And while that's important, in reality, there has to be time for sitting under people. I always tell people, for me, the patronage I look for is around consistency. If you cannot sit consistently under people, you will not succeed. And this comes through from the Renaissance. And I think that's an important lesson for us in modern times, that the goal shouldn't be to run after the big office fast. The goal should be to learn from the people in those big offices, because if you can learn from them, you can become a Leonardo da Vinci, because then you can pick up the principles that they have learned, that, they, that no one will ever be able to transfer to you in a day, in two years, in three years. I started my career with um, PwC, and I think I had um, uh, 
Rafa talking about it. And every time I do a talk, I honor that space because it's not so much even the work that I learned, which is important. I mean, I'm an analytical because of the work that I did there, but it's the connections I build. And that didn't happen in two years. It happened in a long period of time. I tell people, some of my closest friends, coaches, and mentors today are people that I connected with in that space. Um, it's the networks, it's the skills, it's the mindset, but that doesn't happen overnight. And so that whole idea that people can be able to innovate by just jumping from one corner to the next is something that we need to kill. And so mentors matter is the point of that second uh, point. The second, the third point is potential part Trump's uh, experience again during this renaissance, the church um, was putting up uh, uh, a chapel and the Pope went to a uh, Michelangelo, of course, the patronage helped and he wasn't experienced enough, but they gave him an opportunity to be able to put up um, something in this chapel, which is called Sistine uh, Chapel. That sh and that shows that talent and potential can be more important than the past experience because he was given that opportunity because he was given that platform. He was able to build up on that. Um, and I think that's something that's important in today's world. We need as organizations, as cities, to take calculated risks in individuals who demonstrate excellence in their fields. To be able to say, if you spot a Michelangelo, and a Michelangelo is a, somebody who is gifted. They have um, the capacity to be able to design uh, a talent, in a, I mean, a, a sculpture in a very different way. Way. And they also have the capacity to sit under people consistently. If you find that potential always trumps um, experience is what this illustration shows. And then the fourth point is disaster creates opportunity. This has to be taken with a double dose of um, carefulness. This was a tragic time. Um, the Black Death, which was the fruit of the pandemic, led to a lot of upheaval. And in an extractive way, it's easy to just run from, yes, people died, came from it, modernity. No, um, those are principles that destroy societies. It's That was a sad mo moment um, for the society that they lived by. But the upheaval, sad as this will be, led to less numbers because these were significant deaths. And there were less numbers which then contributed to people increasing the uh, expectations that they had in the workplace. So because there were less workers, the standards of work had to improve over time. Um, and then also people wanted, it's almost the easiest way to explain and also do this with carefulness is what you hear about the pandemic. And after the pandemic, we had a season, I think it's uh, de decreasing that, it had a name um, that led to very many people quitting their jobs. I can't remember the name. And, and people looking for creativity, people looking for purpose. And it was built around just seeing the, the fleetness of life during the pandemic. And so it's easy for us to connect with that because that was recent. Um, by God's grace, it is over. And the, But the point here being, in between all those disasters came some innovations that perhaps, I think the human spirit is very strange. We progress based on very strange things. We were having a conversation this past weekend around the place of violence in society's progress and the place for violence in marketplace and individual's progress. Um, but the point here being that those disasters created um, opportunities. And then Embracing competition and the search for purpose and meaning, and this is the goal of this session, in which case I will open this up to Karafa in a short while. But one of the things that they did is they embraced competition. Um, and so they fueled um, the competition between Leonardo, Michelangelo, and other artists. And in the process, they were able to build um, art that was extraordinary. And that perhaps just speaks to Again, how humans progress is very interesting. And so just that whole idea of within our societies, how do we embrace and build competitive spirits that are healthy, of course, but that allow people to constantly be able to build up for innovation. And then lastly, the Renaissance was fueled by a collective desire to uncover the deeper meaning of life. It was people who were searching for um, 
the purpose of existence in between the dark age people started to have hard questions around is this it um is there more can we think about different things how can we create art that represents the different things how do we spread the ideas um became conversations that became prevalent at that time and so the search for meaning and purpose became very prevalent in the renaissance time and i think it's back um, i hear these conversations very um, awake today. And so that's what sort of brought this session together. How do we have that conversation for meaning and purpose and perhaps learn some lessons from the Renaissance? Karafa, have I taken you through a Renaissance? Do you now understand a bit more of the Renaissance era? Questions? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Esther, for walking us through that. I think now I have a good understanding of the art and history around uh, the Renaissance. A bit of few parallels I could draw from there was, you know, COVID and the rise of sponsors. I don't think that in Kenya was in light of the Renaissance. Uh, but a few things, just before you came in, we ran a poll and it was around how uh, we view work in terms of do we find purpose in it and how many Kenyans are actually engaged or disengaged from their work. I've just published the results and this is what uh, the audience had to think about, I uh, had to say around this topic. And so maybe the first question to you would be, um, looking at your experience uh, as a professional in, in the corporate space and also running uh, a leadership experience such as LAPID, why do you think these results might be considered to be a true uh, representation of how we feel, uh, by we I mean Kenyans, feel about our work? You know, we are disengaged from our work and why is it not a good thing or is it a good thing so i can't even get into that i can't answer you correctly and well that question is a very deep question that has many parts to it but let me give two simple answers um one is it's not a good thing and especially from an african context perspective if we are going to build the solutions that we need in this continent we have to be more engaged um, you cannot innovate as a disengaged person. That's just the long and the short of it. And so when we talk about 80% of people are disengaged, what in effect you're saying on 90%, in effect you're saying that people don't have the capacity to be able to innovate. Now, the West may have that luxury, we don't. And so that in itself tells you that we need to figure out how do we fix that question. But the second part of it is, and this is historical, is how work came about. And when you look at that renaissance, when you look at education, when you look at where we are at as far as um, how work came about, there's a TED talk around this that people can also look for. We have work philosophies that don't, don't serve us. And so for some people, the conversation for work is, work is a necessary evil, work is a slave, work is a means to an end. And so we then leave and there's a class we do this around the numbers, but we live half of our lives for survival. Um, and uh, the question we must sit with, is it possible to survive and not or and to create? Um, the way to think about work is through, does it give me money? Does it allow me to express myself? And so expression is a big part of work, but also meaning. Um, and does it give me a sense of meaning? If you have a disconnect of those three things, you have a disengaged person. Interesting, uh, meaning, creation. And I would just like to throw something else out there. Uh, we're living in times where purpose and passion are construed to be one and the same thing. Do you think that is um, the truth in light of work? You know, we are always first taught, follow your passion then find work al along it. But I find sometimes that could be a bit confusing because it's in the doing that you actually identify these things. What are your thoughts on this around purpose, passion and work? So, and we talk about this a lot, but I think at the heart of that conversation is linear thinking. Um, and it's the conversation around, we constantly are trying to box things so that they become one or the other. Um, I don't subscribe to that theory for starters. I think life is not as linear as we'd like it to be. I call about it as Mazogodanyo is a big part of life. Um, and so if you step away from trying to fix life to be linear, you then have a higher chance of understanding meaning and a higher chance of understanding purpose. The proponents of the passion, one of the bigger proponents of the passion um, mindset is 
the let's see jobs who did not live by that philosophy is this tragedy of it um there's a conversation that happens between the difference between a passion mindset and a craftsman mindset. Um, and the people who've created that conversation is that they found this passion mindset thing was confusing, it was frustrating people, and it was producing zero results. And so they started to ask, is this passion mindset real? Or is it, you know, and we had, had a conversation with one of our alumni this, I think, last week. And we're talking about how when you're at the end of a process, it's very easy to miss the process especially when you're at the end. Um, and so if you ask Steve Jobs what built his business, he will tell you his passion. I don't believe that that's the case. If you look at his journey, you find a guy who was in India and a guy who was in, yes, in India to try to understand himself, but a guy who also comes back and whacks his head off. Um, and, and in the process he bumps into these things that are he's extremely passionate about but i don't know that i find the guy stuck waiting for what he's passionate about and that's my problem with the philosophy of um what am i passionate about i meet so many people and especially young people who are in a rat race of what am i passionate about how do i find the things that i love doing do as you do you will find do with excellence, do with your full self, as you do, you will find. If however you get obsessed with finding, you will get stuck. Um, because one of the philosophies I love, and it's a quote that I think is prevalent within rapid space, life is lived forward, understood backwards. As you, as you do things um, and think less in either or. So as an example, I, started my professional career as an auditor. And in between the slack seasons, I would wake up and actually I didn't. My coach, one of my coaches told me, Esther, you should just sign up for the learning and education department. And during slack, go do some training. And so I would go to Uganda, I'd go to Zambia, I'd go to Tanzania. I was eventually sent to Amsterdam that I loved. And I was doing those things as I audited, as I did my consulting work, and on, I was serving in church. And in the process, I started to discover, actually, this is something that I really enjoy doing, and I can be able to even to build on it. Um, and that is sort of what happens for most people. It's you live life, you bump into things. Um, the idea that there's a magical moment where you sit and it all falls on you happens to 3% of us. We, most of us are not the 3%. I mean, so we have to be careful about whether those things are making us get stuck. Where are you today? How can you do that well? And how can you run experiments around you that allow you to learn more about yourself? That's the space of and, not or. Have I confused you? Almost, almost. But I'm glad that I'm a lapida. So a big part <laughs> of it was I could pick it up from class. And uh, and you have introduced something uh, around um, craftsmanship. And Michelangelo is known for his level of craftsmanship from an art and from a science perspective. But you also said that Renaissance requires a sponsor. For me, I equated that to having to work under someone which is to believe is something that you covered. Um, we have the conclusion that work, particularly working under someone, is uh, something equitable to slavery. Also, something I just have to do to pay my dues and live. You have significant experience both in corporate and now in the entrepreneurship space. You've also sat as one of the panel of judges in the National Bank uh, Be Your Own Boss show. What are your thoughts around how people should, or rather how young uh, aspiring entrepreneurs should be considering both corporate and running their own businesses from a point of uh, understanding work and also uh, being able to own some of these skills? That they need? So a couple of weeks ago, we were at Capital FM and we had a fantastic conversation with a Farid that stayed with me and that I like to repeat. Um, and he was talking about how he's done his work for the last 23 years. And he believes in passion. And he's talking about how now when he encounters work and is passionate about it, it creates wealth. But I remember telling him, and we had this discussion and we agreed on it, he has built the character to sustain whatever it is that he encounters today. 
Um, and so it's easy for him today to think about, I'm passionate about the idea of the intersection between media and changing Africa. As an example, he will create wealth from it. But he will create wealth from it not because he's passionate about it. It is, it helps. But it will, he will, it will, he will create wealth from it because he has the character for it. And that character is built through the consistency of craftsmanship, which is that he's done the 23 years of sitting under other people, of learning, of waking up at 4 a.m. and running a radio show consistently for a long period of time. So to come back to the question that you've asked, and their ideals and their realities, my personal belief is that everybody should start in employment. I will repeat, because I don't do popular conversations. My personal belief is everybody should start in employment. What that does is things that people underestimate when, and you only realize them 10 years in, five years in, you start to see you think differently. What employment, and again, I say this is ideal, I will talk about realities. What employment can do for people is one, teach you to work. The world is built on craftsmanship. At the heart of craftsmanship is discipline. It doesn't matter how creative Michelangelo was. If he did not have the craftsmanship, this was a nice thing. It was hype, it was excitement. And so employment teaches people discipline, good and bad, but that is a life skill. And that's what Farid was talking about when you are saying him sitting under people. The second thing that employment does is it teaches people to be structured. And that again needs, you cannot learn that without working under people. We, and especially from an African Kenyan context, I think one of the DNAs of Kenyans is we are creative. Um, and you mentioned me uh, being a judge in the You've Got Business show. I could, I could see that, but I could also see how those businesses will do very little. And it's big, not all, but a good number. And uh, before we got towards the end, I think we did quite a bit of cleaning. I mean, we literally got so many guys and had to keep doing the final thing in search of the people that we can be able to expand on. But the problem isn't the creativity. The problem is the discipline to create. The problem is the structure to create. I remember talking to a, a lady who I will never forget. I even wrote a blog around it. And she'd been running a business for nine years. And I asked her one or two questions, which for me, but I was still holding back uh, because I could tell if I overdo it, I will just discourage her. And that wasn't my goal, but it was also my goal to expand her. And so she was very thrown off. Um, and in fact, I could tell. A few weeks later, we met at one of the events and she took me on the side and she told me, Esther, I couldn't sleep for two days. She was more mature. So she was perhaps in her mid 40s is where I would suggest that she is at. I couldn't sleep for two days. And that's because of the things that you told me. I told her that means I did my job well because that's my job. Um, and then she told, and then I asked her, what did you do about not sleeping? She told me she would wake up and work on the things that I asked her to do. And I told her, good job. And then she told me what she did. And I was happy for her because she was starting to put structure. Then I threw at her two other things. And then she told me, you don't want me to sleep for a few more weeks. I told her, yes. That is what building a business is. It's not just the excitement of the idea. It's the discipline. It's the structures. And that's what employment gives people. And then it's the relationships. So when you think about people building, not putting up things for you need to be able to leverage on relationships. Um, and those relationships are built by time that is built by discipline. The people who support me, for example, if I call them today, they know me um, and they will show up. And that's built by character, by time. So that's why I advocate for employment. Now, I said ideal. I do realize two gaps exist in that ideal. One is that there are no jobs in this market. And two, there are very many jobs with employers who will not grow you. 
So I do realize those realities. And so it's very easy to do the time, not build the discipline, not build the structures, not build the networks that you then need to build your business. My encouragement and my challenge, the word encouragement just came out and I just thought it is a lie. But my challenge to the people who are passionate about entrepreneurship, figure out people that you can shadow and work under. Um, and what employment is one form of sponsor or patronage, but there are many other forms. Um, when I think about people who I've worked closely with, it's they they find a way of engaging with me. And in the process, I'm able to speak into the things that they're able to do. And so if you're going to be an entrepreneur, because you must be an entrepreneur, you must do the work of building the things that I talked about. And that's about, can I get a mentor and really consistently work under them? Because you will not figure out those things you're trying to figure out in two sessions with a mentor. This whole idea, and it's the reason I put that story there, this whole idea of of extracting from people and imagining that you will get anything. Imagine you'll get basics and people will release you and they can tell it's basics. Um, so you must find a mentor, a sponsor, a person that you can sit under consistently to build the discipline, the structure, the networks that we talked about. I am speaking towards the reality that people have. Have I answered your question? Yes, yes, you have. And I like that you've been able to see the duality of the situation and also just walk us through that. And I like that also in Lapid, I, I am a beneficiary of two of the key programs that the organization runs, the flagship and also the Crossroads program. And in Lapid, we are big on mentorship and how we can leverage on the experience and the expertise of um, very uh, talented and experienced professionals just to guide us through this, particularly the lead marketplace program, which has been designed uh, for young professionals. We're just starting within the past and uh third year of their of their work um like then we have that for more experienced professionals who are looking to ask another question now around purpose most of them i believe we've come into the program with the question of now i think i know my purpose uh or i have an inclination towards the kind of work that i need to do but i am not there yet in the space that i am in i am doing something uh that i would rather not be doing and so the question is, uh, one, first, what are some of the common pitfalls that we can avoid as we're looking to make those transitions? And two, what happens to you as a young person who has just stepped into the marketplace and you figure out, uh, clearly, there are quite a number of things that I need before I am even able to move ahead. Um, how do I go about the process of getting a mentor uh, and also trying to understand how I can leave my purpose through the work that I'm just starting out to learn about. You've asked me very good questions. Must a little more in your question. <laughs> but let me just uh, speak to the ones I had, and then you will bring the ones that I may not have had. Let me first speak about the programs that you mentioned, and I like what you talked about. Um, and for anybody who is looking to invest in themselves, I would challenge you to find your way to crossroads if you have more than five years of experience. If you have less than that, find your way into lead marketplace. If you're fresh in campus, find your way into um, fresh in campus or have finished campus recently, uh, find your way into one of the other programs. And the reason is, my experience, let me talk about two kind of things about transitions. My experience has been, and a lot of organizations don't have the capacity to invest in people heavily. Um, and there are debates around it. So as a market, as a society, we're talking about how universities are releasing half big graduates. And, they, and so all employers, all organizations are up in arms. On the other hand, universities are saying you marketplace people must train. I do believe in the place of universities, but actually I see a bigger value in the training that happens in the marketplace. There are things you cannot understand until you've hit the marketplace. But unfortunately, a lot of organizations don't have the time or the capacity or the willingness to train people. And because of that, even those organizations that do training, they focus on tech technical skills. And so you're a quantity surveyor as an example, Karafa. It is how do we equip you to be a fantastic quantity surveyor? Now, unfortunately, your quantity survey is dependent on you as a human. You're not yet a robot. 
Because of that, if the organization invests in you heavily as a quantity surveyor, but doesn't invest in you as a human being and help you to understand yourself, help you understand your strengths, your weaknesses, um, your areas of coming is with ease or what we call with the flow, they will, you will never be able to do that quantity survey job the way you can do it with a sense of purpose and meaning. And so I think that's what distinguishes our programs. It's that we start with helping the person understand themselves as human beings to understand the experiences that they've gone through, to be able to ask if I look backwards, what are the things that stood out for me and how do I build around that? Um, I think that's one thing I wanted to mention. The second thing I had you talking about, and also I find as human beings, and this is perhaps related to the question you asked about transitions, what happens when humans are going through transitions is we like to be busy. And that looks like, how do I get a hit? you know, an excitement hit. I will call it that. <laughs> Some people will not agree with that name, but maybe it's the sanitize. And, and to be fair, sometimes also it's organizations that will make you to do that. So I have found when people start out their career, they sometimes you just need to do what you need to do. And by the fifth year, you start to ask, is this it? Is this all I want to do with my life? If you work with a smart employer, as I did, they will keep you busy. And so for me, for example, I was sent on a secondment to the UK around that same time. I um, mean, I started and, and that buys time. And then I find some people, what they do is they go back and do their MBA and their master's that buys time. Um, but you haven't still addressed the core question, which is who am I, what matters to me? And so what happens with transitions is it's very easy to get busy, um, but not do the real work of digging self-reflection and I, I want to specify that because sometimes people imagine there's a magical process that goes out, out there um, and you hear a voice that tells you this is who you are no the answers are actually inside of you the one thing I agree with the renaissance is the same thing I don't agree with um, the thing that they did is they empowered people not to look outside themselves and so this idea that we wait for God to send us rain we wait for God to send us um, knowledge God has given the power inside human beings. That's why he says your, his Holy Spirit rests and lives inside of us as a temple. And so that's what I agree with from a Renaissance perspective. I think you have to be careful about that because there's still limitedness in humanity. But the point I'm trying to make is um, transitions are easy to be sidetracked by things. Um, and you have to do the hard work. And the hard work often is around self-reflection. The hard work is often around, often involves a lot of coaching. And that's a reason why I personally enjoy Crossroads a lot because I'm able to do quite a bit of one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, I love the fact that our people within the marketplace have one-on-one -on -one sessions with our career coaches, with our leadership coaches. I love that the people within um, some of the pillars, we all the pillar will interact with somebody with a will interact with a coach. And what that does is they serve as a mirror. There are things you will not see about yourself. I was with a friend of mine yesterday and I was telling them for the last four, three, four years, maybe three years, I have had somebody in my life who will speak to the things I don't see. That's a coach. I have had the privilege of being in fellowship programs where they will pay money to and coaching is expensive because it's a it's such a gift and so the coach or a therapist but there has to be a third party who is allowing you to see what i am not seeing and so that's a very big part of transitions because transitions are about self-awareness at their heart I have answered the second question the last question i will answer because i feel like is you said I have landed in a job and it's not the right job. I can't remember what you said. I told you you said too much. You will just recap for me. But I think the thing I wrote here is make peace with time. Um, I constantly tell people we have to stop living life as an emergency. There are things you discover with time. So stop fighting with time. Make time your friend. Allow time to teach you. 
um, and is what people mean when they say make peace with process. It is there are things about yourself, Karafa, that only time will teach you. And that is okay. That's a profound way to end that last bit, uh, especially in a generation where we expect uh, to be able, you know, the access of the knowledge has given us an opportunity to accelerate ourselves, but also uh, believe that we can figure out a bit about life while living externally. But there is quite a bit of self-knowledge that needs to get into it. And one of the things you also pointed out was we cannot separate the person from the work. And even when you try to approach work from a point of, I will be someone else at work and someone else at home, it will not be a very sustainable way of living this. And this is why I truly appreciate the opportunity that I had at LAT, uh, going through the flagship program from Lead Self, Lead Marketplace, onto Lead Africa and also Crossroads. It has helped me understand who I am and how I can bring out uh, my personal self now to the workplace and have what I would call a unity of life. And I'm also glad that tomorrow we'll actually also be hosting another webinar uh, with members of our lead marketplace pillar. Uh, as they'll be sharing more about what they've gained and they'll be able to share more on how they've been able to position themselves as a brand. And we'll be sharing the registration links to that webinar after this call, just so that you can plug in and also get to see what we have on offer within the lead marketplace pillar. Speaking back the conversation to Enesa, and this is an opportunity now for us also I uh, feel some questions from the audience. I had someone pose a very interesting question, especially when you're talking about Mutan the drama queen and her podcast on Ujwaji. And his name is James and he asked, how is conscious capitalism expected to be different from that which we already know? Uh, in a world where we are good on rebranding and marketing and repackaging the same thing, what are your thoughts on conscious capitalism versus what we have right? Um, I would encourage because I'll need to close. I'll need to leave in the next ten minutes. So if there's anybody who has any questions, can he post them and so that he's able um, to aggregate them? Can you also share the links to the application in the chat rooms so that anybody who would like to apply is able to apply? Um, so there's some things you're saying that I want to just speak to very high level. Um, so the session is talking about meaning and purpose. And I think I've talked about meaning and purpose in high level in terms of when I think about my own journey and just a quick run through that, though I see the value of connecting dots backwards. I see the value of coaches. I see the value of mentors. Um, I am sure my purpose was not born when I started Lapid. I am 100% sure it was born when I was born. <laughs> and I can see the hand of God actually in it. I, I remember so my, my days. I have worked through the last 20 years, so it's starting to look like it's a lot. Um, but I remember education. I hear different names now, but I did education when we had Nasari 1 and Nasari 2 and Nasari 3. Um, and so it was the three years of Nasari 1, Nasari 2, Nasari 3. And I remember I didn't do Nasari 3. My teacher said, Esther, this girl needs to be jumped and go to standard one. Because of that, I went to standard one as a young person. Um, and I see a lot of that in my life. Um, I remember going to campus and when I landed, I was in Kenyatta University, when I landed, they released a summer program and it meant you could do your degree in three years. And that meant that at 21, I had finished campus and those days, nowadays I think it's common. Those days that wasn't common. I remember, I'll never forget my, the interviews and in PwC and one of them asking me, Esther, how are you 21 and you have been working because I was actually already working. And, and, and those are examples that I used to speak about acceleration. I see a lot of spaces where God has accelerated me. Um, I went to UK, people used to stay there for two years. I did 19 months. And then I called and I said, I am coming back. Um, and they couldn't understand because people wanted to do five years. And that in many ways has been the journey that God has taken me through. And I say that to say purpose is understood backwards. And that's the value of sitting under people because their daughter, I remember recently I sat 
in one of those squads. Squads are small groups. We do a lot of the work that we do within community. And one of the guys was explaining their journey and I could see the dots so fast. And I remember him saying that he feels like I understood them. I think I did that in about an hour and they all introduced themselves. But that's sort of the, there are things you cannot see. Um, there are things that people outside you can see with more ease. And, and so when I think about my purpose and I think about the meaning of my life, I see it backwards. Um, I also see the value of what I call tribes. Um, I mentioned that I'm going to be in India on for a summit around technology for good is my summary of it. I will put a post. It's a bit perhaps more technical than that. But I see how and that's also just again goes back to the value of consistency. You, if you have consistency, there are things that start to unlock, um, and they unlock in the presence of tribes and in the presence of communities. So I see how God has just worked very many things out for me that then form the meaning and the purpose. Um, and that's why even when I think about where we are at today, it's very important for us to learn from the Renaissance and the past eras and be able to translate those into what that is, does that mean for today's world. And so that takes me to the question on conscious capitalism. Again, a very long question. Please look for the book. I will tell you what I think. I will also make room for this not to be accurate. It is fine. These are my very thoughts. Um, and I'm saying that because I know this is a bit controversial. I personally do not believe that we can be able to clean up um, capitalism using the conversations of conscious capitalism. Um, I see how we are using frameworks like the ESG, which has become very prevalent, to attempt to normalize consciousness. Um, I think we have some fundamental work we need to do around how did we create the mess, and that's a consciousness, um, not conscious conversation. And so asking what about our society has bred an extractive system that thrives in just taking. Um, I am part of a climate justice movement that I love. And I love it because we talk about climate, not from the context of um, climate, uh, carbons, and um, all those things which are important. But we talk about it from the fundamentals of how did we get here? How did we end up in a space where we, we cannot be entrusted with Mother Earth? What about the consciousness of today's life makes us not care about how we are looking after Mother Earth? That's the fundamental question. Um, and at the center of it is principles of profit uh, over people. It's principles around success at all cost. It's principles around the industrial revolution that say, let's keep building and taking. But in reality, that doesn't work. Um, and so it, conscious capitalism, if it is to be really um, deconstructed, has to be about the consciousness that created it. I haven't, yeah, it is just what it is. <laughs> Thank you, and I, and I could see you trying to really package the entire conversation into a few minutes, and there is a lot there, but I just think what I got in, in, in summary is first, we need to learn about what is and there to reimagine something different. And I like that, I love it, we believe that we need to reimagine the possible, and we work uh, with young people, uh, with young professionals who are keen to unlock their full potential and reimagine their careers, reimagine themselves, and reimagine their contribution to society and to the world as a whole. And if you're here and you're asking the questions of uh, where do I go next, uh, some um, of the particular, someone in the chat box has put that, but I wouldn't have time to respond to that about how do we manage transitions in the workplace. And I believe looking at, we're going to be having a series of masterclasses. These are some of the questions that I will invite you, Mary, to uh, consider joining in the next session, which will be taking place on Monday. And I believe. We we'll look at it from a point of technology and also we'll have a moment to fill it uh, with the rest of uh, the panelists who will be joining us there. If you're asking the question of 
how do I have skill myself? I have just started out uh, within my first uh, three years and I have realized, well, these are the gaps that I have. These are the roles that I want to get to. How do I bridge that particular gap? Then the lead marketplace accelerate program is for you. If you have uh, significantly more experience over five years, asking now, I think I would like to take a different trajectory in my career. I have a team I have been um, allocated to be responsible for their results and also for their well-being. How do I equip myself with the skills that I need to effectively lead them, but also grow them? And that is the purpose of the Lapid Crossroads program. We have shared our registration links in the chat box, and I believe that should you require any further information, you can check us out on our social media pages. Right. For example, today we are streaming this live on LinkedIn. Uh, we will also have a, we have a good number of resources on our YouTube channel and also on our website where you can learn more about this program and get to equip yourself with the knowledge that you need to be able to unlock your full potential. Now, before I bring this session to a close, I would just like to put it out there for you, Esther. Do you have any parting shots? Do you have any thoughts that you would like to build upon on our session on Monday that you would like to put across? As we come to our close. I, of course, I have very many, but I want to summarize them into two. <laughs> um, I do believe that in the time that we live in, there are several things that we need. And I know we haven't spent too much time talking about sort of the changes that are going on today, and because it's a lot. Um, I like the way there's a conversation right now happening about de-dollarization that has become the world coin. I do believe in our age, we will see digital money becoming the norm, the good and the bad about it. Um, what AI is doing, what Web3 is making possible, there's a lot there, but there's but also the question of how do we sustain ourselves because it doesn't matter whether we create robots if Earth doesn't exist or we do not exist, it doesn't help. <laughs> anyway, we did not spend too much time on the actual changes that are going on and we won't do that now. But I think I wanted to just conclude with three things that I think are very important in the changes that we are going through today. The first, after, and the first two I've talked about, I just wanted to add one more. One I will just recap is character will drive change. It's human beings who make things happen. But human beings need character to be able to drive those things. Um, and so we've talked about the character from the extent of the discipline, um, the, uh, the structure, and the networks. And so character is a big thing. The second thing we've talked about is the place of meaning that will continue to be a big deal. In a world where you have excess information, where you have excess possibilities, the sooner you're able to define what matters to you, the better. And so that journey of exploring the things that you are about and the world is exploring, not a magical moment, um, needs to be at the forehead, a forefront of everybody. If I was having a conversation, I was telling somebody, if I, th if I think about education, I would change it ASAP if I could. It is, it is not relevant for us to learn things that ChatGPT will give us in two seconds. It really is truly isn't. Um, but there are specific things that in the short term we need we need to have critical thinking. We need to have creative thinking. We need to have emotional awareness. Um, and those are things that go back to meaning and purpose. The first thing that I just wanted to highlight, and we will spend more time on this on Monday, is the possibilities that technology give. I am an accountant by training. Uh, so I will not talk about this as a technologist. I will be a host who asks questions and I'm looking forward to that. But I, I remember having a conversation with a close friend of mine the other day, and we're talking about the power of coding literacy as an example. And he was saying, in Africa, we need 200 million people with coding literacy. And, and that says speaking to coding literacy as almost like English. You know, normalize coding to the level of we can have this conversation here. And I like the examples that he gave me. He was saying, think about yourself as um, Karafa, as uh, the chief of staff of Lapid. If you have coding literacy, what you do is you ask, what can I code together that makes my life easy? So you create an app that you use to manage your team. You create an app that you use to manage the schedules of the classes. You don't wait for somebody to do that. That's what coding literacy is. But also, such and majority of us will have coding literacy, and so you must identify where you are at. 
and ask whether you're above the coding literacy. The reality, the real change for coding will be brought about by 11 year olds who are natives of coding and the related things. But also the other thing is we have to reframe technology, not just as something that we do, but as a tool for societal progress. Um, I remember a while back, and I am sure I'm running out of my time, but I remember a while back uh, talking to somebody who was using their phone to read a leaf of maize, and it's able to tell we will produce from this maize 100 cobs, maize cobs. And from this maize, we will produce 10 maize cobs. We will get 10 maize cobs. Let's kill this thing and continue to feed it with fertilizer because it is done. And that's the power of technology that it could help us with agriculture, with food security, with education. And so just normalizing technology, not for techies, but technology for all of us is part of this renaissance. I end there. Wow. Uh... Hard to believe it's hard to end there. And I'm so glad that we're going to be having a separate session just to explore tech for good and how we non-technical people, you know, people, well, of course, I, I could be confused because of the glasses, but the, the truth is I use chat GPT to source a lot of my brain cells, uh, especially when it comes to technology, uh, can actually leverage on the age that is coming upon us. And thank you very much for even just sharing about how we as individuals can now stand apart because um, my younger self will have said the machines are taking over and Arnold Schwarzenegger was right all along uh, around Terminators. But then we still are creating the robots and we need a way to coexist with them. And that is a conversation that I hope we could explore as we move the conversation on Monday around Tech for Good. Thank you very much, Esther, for taking the time to walk us through this particular conversation. And I hope that all of us have found this to be a very good way to start the conversation of how do we reimagine the next phase of our life. How do you find purpose? How do you make your work meaning? How do you contribute in a meaningful way to community, to society, and also just the people around you? Are some of the questions that you will start to explore uh, with yourself, but also with this particular Renaissance Rebirth series. Asante Nisana for taking the time to join us this evening. It has indeed been a pleasure to host you. Unfortunately, time is not on our side and we'll have to bring it to a close here. If you missed quite a bit of the conversation, you can find us uh, on our LinkedIn pages at Lapid Leaders Africa. You'll find a recording of the session. You can review it and then we can kickstart the session on Monday on a high note. Right here, I have someone who has raised their hand. And now, since I have not given the audience a moment, Sylvia, I am going to give you just a minute to say what you have. And I hope that it is a word of thanks as we come to the close of our conversation. Over to you, Sylvia. I think I need to give you the rights to unmute. Uh, so, hi, Karafa. Hi, I'm so happy to have been here and I am a beneficiary of Lead Self, hoping to join Lead Marketplace soon. So my question to Esther or the host really is, I read a post that if your job should do two things for you, either help you meet your needs or motivate you to become better. Uh, that thing of passion and all that. So if your job does not do either for you, is it okay to quit? And after that, so I mean, okay, mine is just around there. If it's not doing both for you, should you quit or should you just hang on or should you just do the the uh, traditional thing where we all do that? Oh, just stay, just stay here, hang on as you wait for you know. You cannot just leave a job and then go to they are clueless. And I know Esther did it as a leap of faith and it worked. To some, it may not work. And yeah, a vote of thanks on top of my question is thank you so much for this. And I am glad to be a member of this, of Lead, of Lapid Leaders Africa. So I hope this webinars just continue. They, they, are, they are helping me, they are, yeah, they are just motivating me for sure. Thank you. All right, Esther, 
a genie has been let out of the Pandora's box. Kindly use Twin to respond to this. You can. You're on mute. Uh, thank you. Um, and literally, this has to be the last thing that I do because I also know that time is very much um, gone. I I will just give a simple answer of um, I don't believe in quitting because of the sake of quitting. I am extremely different from most people. I had that worked for eight, ten years. Um, people underestimate what ten years do for people. I had done eight years in one organization, I'd done another two years in a different organization. So it's easy to see the story in the middle, but actually I had done quite a bit of time um, and picked up quite a bit that was possible to replicate. Um, and so I do not advocate for people to quit for the sake of quitting. I also do not think the options are just those two. I think part of it is the either or mindset has to go away because that's what the linear thinking does. Um, I have found that there are multiple possibilities as far as um, what's uh, possible with, and 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 so it's asking what are the what are the possibilities within the context of where you are at. Um, one possibility is leave. But another possibility is what can you create in the presence of what you are at? That second one is the one that people need to spend more time on. Um, Sylvia, I don't know if I've answered your question. I have given you the simple answers of no. And, and if nothing else, train yourself. Use that space. I hate it, but I can train myself to be a resilient person in this place. That is a, a skill that will help your head. Um, but yeah, I, I get the question and I know I have not given a simple answer, it's just that I'm also, I would need to leave, I'll actually exit right now, um, but I want to say thank you to everybody for logging in and for this conversation, a big thank you to uh, Rispa and Karafa who've been hosting this session, um, thank you for putting it together, um, thank you for everybody who logged in, I look forward to seeing us. Um, in the coming sessions, and I, I'm sure you picked your one or two things, kindly use um, the session to be able to uh, wrap up, uh, to think through what it means for you, perhaps, Karafa and Rispa, you can lead that conversation for five minutes, and then you guys can close what this means for you guys, but it's nice to see all of you, I can see quite a number of guys who've gone through the program, and I think that's the value of this webinars, because also it allows people to be able to connect and remember some of the things that we constantly talk about, so thank you for logging in, thank you for taking part in this conversation, thank you Karafa for hosting this session, thank you Rispa for putting this together, I wish us a good night, I'm out. Good night, Austin. This part, we started okay. together, and I think it's only fitting that we end this together. Uh, okay. We started with a conversation about whether we find work for first school, and in between, we have been working to bring this session to a very fruitful close. I'd like just to hand it over to you, share some final remarks, a vote of thanks, and mm -hmm. also possibly a closing prayer. Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much, Esther. Thank you, and also Esther in absentia now that she's already left. And to everyone who has been a part of this conversation, I'm sure that you have found that this was very insightful. And you have also found that it's also a challenging conversation, actually. And if you feel challenged from this conversation, then the session has done what it should have been doing, what it was supposed to do. Uh, personally, one of my bigger takeouts from this session, Karafa, is the value of, you know, considering to wait to look at things um, backward. You know, the way you're told things only make sense backward, it's not forward. Um, so I feel like this is a conversation that has posed a challenge in my heart to just think about some decisions I'm making in life. Are they, am I waiting to make decisions forward or backward? But something else that I've, I've also really appreciated is that one of the bigger things that will ground people is a strong sense of self. And that in the midst of whatever we are doing, we have to find the space to do that for ourselves, because otherwise it's easy to get lost in activity, get burnt out, and then feel 
as if we are not being fully served by the spaces we are in, but it's up to us to keep creating time. And then the third thing that I have loved the most is about the power of sitting under people who can train you, who can teach you. And I love that that, that is what Lapid Leaders Africa does a lot. So for anyone who's here, just if you've not had it, you need to sit through Lapid Leaders Africa. If you're more than five years in employment, you need to be part of the Crossroads Plus that will be starting on the 2nd of September, 2023. And for anyone who is between zero to three years of work experience, join the Lapid Leaders Marketplace, a lead marketplace accelerator program that will be starting on the 12th of August, um, 2023. For now, Karafa, I think I'd like to end this meeting for all of us. And I can see someone like Samson saying that he looks forward to the next session. Yes, you better be looking forward because it will definitely be even more amazing. Can you imagine what can be more amazing than this? But it will be. So we look forward to seeing you there. For now, Karafa, I invite everyone to please unmute your mic so that we can wish each other good night for. 30 seconds, then I'll end this meeting for all of us. So maybe I can start with you, Karafa. Have a good night. And thank you for being here as well. You've been an and a good time. night to you, Rispa. I have given everyone the permission to unmute themselves. Feel mm -hmm. free to wish us all a good night. Thank you and have a good night. Thank good you. Night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good, day and, uh, have a good okay. Good night. Good night, everyone. We look forward to seeing you. Good night, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.